Hello everybody and welcome to the Gyrocopter Flying Club and part 7 in our History of the Gyroplane series. Before I move things on in terms of history, someone asked me a very good question about regulation and what I thought. In this film therefore, we'll look at the issues from 1970. What viewers might like to consider is that the gyroplane was invented principally to make flying safer. The big killer with fixed wing aircraft back in the 1920s and 30s was a classic stall spin loss of control and it still is the number one killer of private aviators today. Indeed the gyroplane solved the problem so successfully that cloud flying was actively promoted as you can see from this advertisement of the day. You could fly in cloud because you can fly so slowly and grub your way through the gloom. You might think this was going to end very badly, but actually it didn't. Perhaps because people just didn't take out cloud flying as that much fun. And remember, Sierra had sold over 150 aircraft before World War II, so it wasn't for the lack of aircraft in the sky. And yet in all this time, there was just but one fatal accident to gyroplanes prior to the Second World War. It was an army captain during a test flight where he dived and effectively flew the aircraft out of limits. Actually, there was one other fatality in France where the pilot failed to remove the control locks. So two fatal accidents in around 20 years. In the US, the accident rate for Benson gyrocopters had been consistently bad and low G was a common theme. Indeed, it was so obvious Benson himself inserted wording into his own pilot manuals. In the UK, the aircraft was selling so fast that Campbell couldn't fulfil the orders fast enough and they were, by sales volume, the second largest aircraft company beaten only by Brit and Norman. Yet despite all the sales interest, which at some point was clearly going to produce an equal volume of pilots to match, both pilot and aircraft licensing were curiously relaxed. Between 1969 and 1970, there were four fatal gyroplane accidents. Two were in official air displays, the other a demonstration flight to buyers, doing effectively the same thing. The Loosley accident at an RAF sponsored display in an aircraft that was very similar to one currently subject to an AAIB investigation, which of itself is surprising given the known additional risks of display flying. But the biggest surprise is that in view of the very well-known sensitivity to G values less than 1G, at the very least it would have been prudent to specifically prohibit such flight manoeuvres that might lead to the same. So that allows me to form the opinion that opportunities were lost in the aircraft permit process to draw attention to what were obvious dangers from lessons learned in the US. Additionally, the Brooks Mosquito had been issued with its permit to fly just six weeks prior to the accident. And yet Flight Magazine reported the accident occurrence in 1969, including a quote from Campbell Aircraft, keen to highlight that the Brooklands Mosquito was a modified version of their product with a host of non-standard parts. It was reflected in the AAIB report some time later. So it begs the question, what regime existed around the permitting of aircraft? Was the Mosquito allowed to be permitted with its accident state, or had Brooks modified the aircraft later? What wasn't in debate are the modifications that took place to the aircraft that is the fourth of our fatal accidents. Here we have an odd combination of a highly modified Benson B-8, where the aircraft had primarily been modified to allow fitment of a VW four-stroke motor, which was heavier than the two-stroke engine that it had originally been designed for, being flown and also test flown by a student pilot. Unsurprisingly, it didn't end well. Although it must have been a surprise to those in authority, because it took the AAIB to report that there appears to be no system of training specifically for gyroplane pilots who must necessarily discover these characteristics for themselves. The absence of such a system of training could well have an adverse effect on the safety and operation of these aircraft, 
particularly when flown by private pilots with a low total level of air experience. Perhaps someone knows the story differently, in which case it would be interesting to hear. However, for now it seems that the Wild West is still in shock.